thank you very much to the Institute for um, this invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my goal this afternoon is twofold. I want to explain and assess um, how we've arrived at this point of crisis again in the Middle East with respect to the rise of uh, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. And I also want to provide a brief uh, assessment and critique of Obama's strategy with respect to ISIS. Uh, will it work? What are its strengths? What are its weaknesses? Um, and if there's time left, I'll sort of insert my own um, set of policy recommendations in terms of um, how things should ideally move forward. Um, this is a topic that's not going away anytime soon. Um, President Obama has uh, stated on several occasions that this question, this particular issue, is going to be with us um, for several years uh, forthcoming. It will, I think, shape uh, the politics of the Middle East in the coming years. I suspect President Obama will have to hand this uh, issue over to the next administration. And I think it's uh, for those reasons that because this is going to be on the agenda, um, not only of the Middle East, but of the entire world for the next several years, it's important that the international community, Europeans, Americans, and others, um, really start to think seriously and get educated on this particular subject. Um, and that's why I've come here today to Dublin, and I'm happy for the opportunity to share with you some, some thoughts. Before I begin, I'll just show you some, a few slides just to sort of set the stage and um, establish a framework. Uh, um, there's some really good ISIS resources. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the American television station, PBS, provided what I think is perhaps the most incisive backgrounder to the rise of ISIS. It's in two parts. I strongly recommend you look at it. It's online. If you want a good sort of background sort of look at um, the Islamic State, that documentary, which I showed to my students just before coming here, is really uh, wonderful. Um, and our uh, website uh, for the center that I direct, the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Denver, has an ISIS resource page um, that um, I'm happy to show to you. Um, it provides, I think, some of the most useful links and background information on ISIS in all its various dimensions. Um, and it's, I think, a great uh, resource for people who are sort of thinking about this issue and want to know uh, more about it. Um, um, ISIS has expanded, surprising uh, to everyone, within a short period of time to occupy a piece of real estate in the middle uh, of the Middle East, about the size of Great Britain, but you know, 81,000 square miles in uh, the heart of the Middle East across the Iraq-Syrian uh, border. Um, I think that map here on the right sort of gives you a rough sort of layout of where the ISIS um, sort of proposed so-called Islamic State um, exists. And, um, and as you can see, the big challenge is that they are um, on the outskirts of Baghdad. That's how far they've expanded in a very short time. And so the big question here in terms of trying to understand this topic is, you know, how did we get here? And critically, what's the best analytical framework to use to try and explain the rise of ISIS? Is this problem fundamentally a problem due to something inherent within um, Islamic culture or Arabic culture? Uh, President Obama has spoken on several occasions um, of this problem of ancient sectarian hatreds in the Middle East between Sunni and Shia. Are we witnessing today some sort of Muslim version of the uh, uh, Christian wars of religion of the 16th and 17th century? Or is the problem with ISIS fundamentally due to the legacy of the American Anglo invasion of Iraq in 2003? What's the best entry point and point of departure to understand this particular topic. Now, my own um, uh, view on how best to interpret this particular crisis, the rise of the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, is that I think we are experiencing this particular problem primarily as a result of the convergence of um, two sets of political processes and issues that, when brought together, I think broadly explains how we um, got to where we are today with the rise of the Islamic State. And these two issues are, first and foremost, the very sordid and negative legacy of the politics of authoritarianism and despotism of the post-colonial Arab state, meshing with and converging with the predictable consequences of state breakdown and collapse. 
And it's, I think, important in this context to ask the question, why Iraq and Syria? Why is it in Iraq and Syria that the Islamic State has arisen, established territory, and has laid claim to a piece of real estate? Why is this not happening in other parts of the Arab Islamic world? And I think the reason and the answer to that question is because it's primarily in Iraq and Syria where you have the most um, negative legacy um, of the post-colonial Arab tyrannies that have destroyed and deeply shaken up and ravaged these societies. If you were to sort of, con sort of put on a spectrum and compare the human rights record, the state-society relations, the um, form and character of political rule of all of the 22 countries of the Arab League, Iraq and Syria should be located at the extreme end of a spectrum of repression. The Ba'athist rule in these two countries was the most sordid, was the most horrific, um, was the most destructive. And I think that has left a particular legacy in terms of um, societal consequences. Also in Iraq and Syria, these are the two countries that are most adversely affected by the consequences of war and state breakdown. Take Iraq, for example. For the last um, 35 years, approximately, Iraq has been facing um, uh, some form of war in one form or the other. Eight years of war with Iran, Iraq, um, a brief interim period, then the Iraq Kuwait crisis, incredibly robust and intrusive uh, draconian sanctions that destroyed Iraqi civil society. And then in 2003 until today, the American invasion and occupation of Iraq, which has really broken that society apart in many ways. And then in neighboring Syria, similar situation. Since 2011, you've had an uprising, a conflict that has um, deeply shaken um, Syrian society. Uh, the nature of the conflict in Syria for the last three and a half years um, has been borderline genocidal. And that's not something that I, uh, a word that I use lightly. If you read the human rights documentation on Syria, the terms state-sanctioned war crimes and crimes against humanity litter the document, document, doc, documentary record with respect to Syria. Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the UN Special Commission of Inquiry, all of them sort of have copiously documented in over 40 collective reports what has taken place in that country, replete with chemical weapons, a torture archipelago, the mass arrest, um, industrial scale killings, the biggest refugee crisis of the 21st century, um, 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 a, um, a global health crisis, a rape crisis. Um, the nature of the conflict in Syria today has been described, I think, accurately by the United Nations on several occasions as the biggest humanitarian, humanitarian and moral crisis of the 21st century. That has destroyed Syrian society. And it's as a result of these uh, two interwoven and overlapping processes of the legacy of political authoritarianism and state breakdown that you see in these two parts of the um, Arab Islamic world, um, a set of social conditions that have provided an opportunity, um, a ripe sort of set of co social conditions for this type of militant extremism to emerge and to provide for some people an alternative sort of project for the future. Um, so I think that's really the broad, I think, entry point for understanding how we got to this particular point of view. But there's other things that have been happening at the same time that I think explain why ISIS has emerged in these two parts of the world. Um, the question of the political legitimacy of the state in Iraq post-2003 is a big part of the problem here. In the eyes of uh, Iraq's 20% Sunni population, as a result of the um, rise of Shia political parties in Baghdad, over the course of the last you know, 10 to 12 years, the Sunni population in Iraq has been um, marginalized, discriminated against, persecuted. Um, and this is largely a function of, I think, of the policies of Nouri al-Maliki, who has um, uh, pursued these policies of um, Shia preference and also Sunni exclusion that has turned large segments of the Sunni population um, away from the central government. And some of them are sympathizing now uh, with ISIS as a uh, group that perhaps can address and be a voice for Sunni grievances in the context of Iraq. Um, um, that has provided a certain sort of territory and a population that is, in many ways, uh, sympathetic to 
um, an alternative political project, in this case the ISIS project. And um, unless that particular issue is sort of addressed, the question of the future stability of Iraq um, uh, cannot be resolved. And so the question of the political legitimacy of the states in Baghdad is a big part of the problem. And that same problem you know, exists in the context of Syria. The only difference is it's a thousand times worse because in the eyes of most uh, Syrians, 70% at least who are Sunni, they view the government in Damascus as not only being a repressive um, um, fascist dictatorship, but they also feel alienated by a, a regime that is dominated by an Alawite sort of um, uh, religious group and that has, um, um, in the past three and a half years, you know, persecuted and destroyed most of, the, uh, of society, not to mention the 41-year rule of the House of Assad that has left a very sordid legacy. Um, and so I think that's a big problem of the alienation and the marginalization of groups that have destroyed the political legitimacy of the two states and uh, has, has provided an opportunity for ISIS to then step in and say, look, there's no future for you in your existing states. The legacy of political tyranny teaches us that we need to turn elsewhere, come and join our Islamic state. That's the way forward. And that's, the, um, that's unfortunately an idea and a message that has resonance in the eyes of some people in um, Iraq and Syria. Um, now, of course, Syria, I think, is really key also to understanding from a geostrategic and an international perspective how we got to this particular moment. As I've said before, all roads lead to Damascus. And what I mean by that is that um, we are dealing with the ISIS crisis as a result primarily of the failure of the international community to take seriously and to respond effectively to the crisis in Syria that began in the context of the Arab Spring in March 2011. Um, um, the story of ISIS really you know, begins, you can begin it in different places, but generally it begins in the context of 2003 in the aftermath of the American occupation of Iraq. A Sunni militancy emerges. A big part of that is Al-Qaeda, an Al-Qaeda franchise in Iraq. Um, but what happens to that Al-Qaeda franchise in Iraq as a result of the American troop surge, as a result of this Sunni awakening plan that tried to sort of buy off and win over Sunni tribes back to uh, an allegiance with the central government in Baghdad. If you look at what happened to this Al-Qaeda movement that emerged in uh, Iraq after the American occupation, by around 2011, by the time American troops were planning on moving uh, out of uh, Iraq, Al-Qaeda in Iraq is basically a broken uh, movement. It's defeated uh, militarily, largely speaking. It's defeated ideologically. Um, it's um, a, a shadow of its former self. But what happens in 2011 is you have the Arab Spring uprisings. And of course, the Arab Spring comes to um, Syria at that time. And it's a direct result, as a direct result of the um, crackdown, the brutality, the ferocity of the Assad regime's um, response to a citizen's revolt, and the militarization of that revolt, that an opportunity emerges for the remnants of al-Qaeda in Iraq to move over into Syria, take advantage of a power vacuum, and within a couple of years to sort of reconstitute themselves to become the, the most prominent and um, um, efficient and powerful group among the Syrian rebel forces that are fighting Assad. Um, and um, if, you know, if you think about the whole question of you know, Syria over the last three and a half years, when the uprising began in Syria, uh, in March 2011, there was no militant Islamic presence to be found. There was no radical Sunni presence. It was a citizen's revolt. It was largely sectarian, largely nonviolent. But that changes as a result of primarily Assad's crackdown, also as a result of the intervening sort of uh, intervention of neighboring states, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran in particular, but also because the international community really chose not to come to the aid of the moderate Syrian rebels who you know, did have a presence, I think, in the early parts of the Syrian uprising, but were effectively abandoned and, um, 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 and left, to the, uh, left, left to themselves. And that uh, created an opportunity for other groups to step in. Um, and ISIS emerges you know, by 2013 as a major force um, to dominate the landscape in um, in, uh, in, 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 in Syria. Uh, there's a lot of, I think, you know, um, you know, testimony that's coming out from close allies of President Obama, Hillary Clinton, Leon Panetta, all of them who've sort of said that Obama uh, misjudged 
the situation in Syria. He should have acted earlier, should have armed the moderate Syrian rebels, should have taken it much more seriously. And because he hasn't, it has led to the ISIS crisis. And I think those are uh, perspectives that I am I'm sympathetic with. Um, um, right now, there is a major debate in the United States over this whole question of the future of Syria. Now that the United States is getting back involved in the conflict, um, the whole question of Obama's Syria plan is a big question mark. What does Obama plan to do? We don't know. There's a lot of confusion and um, chaos within the White House over this particular issue. And recent reports, just when I left the United States last week, is the Obama administration has now called for a big review and reassessment of US policy towards Syria as a result of the rise of ISIS and as a result of these airstrikes that have begun against the Islamic State. Um, but the key point here, I think, with respect to the ISIS crisis is that there's no fundamental solution to the ISIS crisis. To quote President Obama, there's no way that you can fundamentally degrade and destroy ISIS unless you have a plan for the future of Syria. These two things are intimately linked because if you read American intelligence, two-thirds of the ISIS military forces are in Syria. Um, uh, Syria is the location where the five, Ameri five Western hostages have been um, beheaded. Syria is the place where um, ISIS reconstituted itself and reemerged after having been defeated primarily in Iraq as a major fighting force. It's where most of the foreign fighters have gone. It's where ISIS has its you know, unofficial capital in the eastern town of Raqqa. And so um, um, ISIS and Syria, the political future of Syria, are deeply interlinked. Um, and there's no way of getting around this. With respect to the international community, I'm struck by the parallels um, that I see today with respect to the conflict in Syria and what happened 20 years ago with respect to Bosnia. Uh, the abandonment of um, um, conflicts that involve gross human rights violations that in the case of Bosnia were genocidal, in the case of Syria are neo-genocidal, thinking that these problems can be contained within their borders, that they won't have a spillover effect, um, um, have proven to be much more complicated to fix the more you allow them to fester. I mean, that was basically the view of, um, of Bosnia 20 years ago with the Clinton administration. There was a sense that Bosnia really didn't matter for the West, for the United States. Um, it was it allowed to, it, it, it continued for three years until you had the Srebrenica massacre and the destabilization of, of a large part of Southeastern Europe. And then the United States had to get involved to try and resolve it. We're having a similar situation, almost a replay, broadly speaking, of what ha what's happening in Syria today. The general view in, in the United States, you can listen to a lot of these realist sort of theorists of international relations, such as John Mearsheimer and Stephen Walt and others, who argued, um, we can now see incorrectly that you know Syria just doesn't matter for US national security or for global security. Syria, quote unquote, can be contained within its borders. Yes, there, were, there was gross human rights violations, but from a realist perspective, so what? Interests, core interests were not threatened. And it's a direct result of, I think, that miscalculation that um, we can now see that actually Syria does matter. It matters profoundly. It, destabilized, it has destabilized not only the border areas, but it's a direct result of inaction and failure to respond effectively to Syria that we have the ISIS crisis. These two things are intimately linked, and, um, and here we are again. Um, Obama thinking that he could ignore Syria, um, he could ignore ISIS, has now begun a global campaign to mobilize the international community, and is now sending advisors, troops, aircraft mobilizing the world to re-intervene in Syria. But of course, the, the challenges of trying to put Syria back together today are far more difficult than they were three and a half years ago. The other element here, I think, with respect to the rise of ISIS that explains, I think, some of the ideological appeal and the recruiting of ISIS from the region is that there was um, quite a bit of optimism and hope that the Arab Spring could produce some democratic gains for the region um, if it was allowed to um, continue on a particular course of democratization. Um, uh, but as a result of the failure of the Arab Spring, or more accurately, the crushing of the Arab Spring by the deep states, by the um, authoritarian <laughs> regimes in the region, primarily you know, the old state, I mean, the big case here is really Egypt with respect to the military's reassertion, its subversion of democracy, um, supported and financed by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates that uh, the um, um, prospects for political democratization in the region have been shut very firmly and have been closed. And um, as a result of the inability and the failure of moderate political Islam to 
have a stake and have a foothold in the politics of the region, um, the crushing and the attempt to label the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization and to eradicate them, um, that has produced as an ideological alternative and option the rise of an extremist political Islamist movement. There's a deep and in in intimate connection between the crushing of moderate political Islamic alternatives and the rise of a um, radical Islamic alternative. Um, you can see this quite clearly in the case of Syria. When the Syrian uprising began in 2011, no radical Islamist movement to be seen. They emerge and they gain currency and support as the doors for peaceful political change are closed and people start to look to alternative uh, solutions and options. Um, um, and this all just confirms, I think, what we've known for a very long time, that when um, 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 peaceful revolution becomes impossible, violent revolution becomes inevitable. Um, there's a lot of, I think, evidence to suggest that that's the case. If you sort of look at some of the um, um, narrative statements that were put out by al-Qaeda, as a result of the Arab Spring. Uh, they were completely perplexed, befuddled. Their message was incoherent and ineffective when dictators were to being toppled as a result of peaceful political change in Tunisia and primarily in um, Egypt. There's a really good study that has been put out by the Center for Combating Terrorism at West Point called Jihadi Discourse in the Wake of the Arab Spring, where they chronicle what al-Qaeda was saying in 2011 uh, primarily, they had a message that was simply could not make sense. Their message was the only way for political change is through jihad and through violent revolution. Um, um, when revolution was happening and dictators that they had targeted were falling as a result of peaceful political change, their message did not have resonance. But now that the doors for peaceful political change have closed, now that General El Sisi is back in power, um, you are seeing the radical message of the radical Islamists resonate. Um, reports that I'm getting from Egypt are that there has been a major influx and transfer of young men looking to the Islamic State as an alternative. Um, you see an uptake in violence in Egypt as a result of the closing of that political uh, process of democratization last summer. Um, and I think these two processes are deeply connected. It's not a coincidence that ISIS is emerging and is becoming an attractive alternative in the aftermath of the crushing of the Arab Spring. The other, I think, key element here, if you want to understand the rise of ISIS, um, um, is that a big part of the ISIS crisis is related to a development that has been taking place in the Arab Islamic world and the broader Muslim world for the last 50 to 60 years, and that is the development of the development and the mainstreaming of a particular um, interpretation of Sunni Islam that is deeply sectarian, that is um, um, anti-women, anti-minority, uh, deeply intolerant, justifies, justifies in the support of violence against alternative interpretations of Islam. This trend um, of, of Islamic interpretation is fairly recent historically. It really has its roots, I would say, um, in the last 50 years of the um, Islamic world. And it is deeply connected to what UCLA law professor Khalid Abu al-Fadl has described as a phenomenon um, that he calls the rise of a culture of ugliness in modern Islam. It is this culture of ugliness that he describes as a recent development, and it continues to be the single and most important obstacle to articulating reasonable narratives of the legitimate possibility of Islam's contribution to human goodness in the world. This interpretation of Islam, the dissemination and proliferation of this extremist, ultra-conservative, and puritanical interpretation uh, has its political roots in the internal policies of various countries in the Middle East, but primarily it is a direct result of the policies of one particular major country in the Middle East, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, just to give you an example of uh, what we're dealing with here, there has been a lot of justifiable horror and outrage at the beheading of Western hostages in the last few months by ISIS. But how many people know the number of people that have been beheaded in Saudi Arabia this year? 
64 public beheadings. And so one of my students asked me, Professor Hashimi, why is the beheading of um, four Western hostages the cause of global outrage, but the far greater monthly, sometimes weekly, routine beheadings in Saudi Arabia not the cause of a similar form of outrage? Um, we're dealing here with a particular country and an interpretation of Islam that is deeply connected to the rise of what um, is widely known as Wahhabism. This puritanical interpretation of Islam is, I think, deeply connected to the ISIS crisis. If you look at the political theology, the justification of the brutality, the attack on Yazidi minorities, on women, on uh, violence, the justification of violence, the um, demonization of Shia Muslims, the um, attacks on other Sunni Muslims who happen to have different interpretations of Islam, this is all deeply connected to the um, teachings of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, the sort of founder of Wahhabism in the you know, uh, 18th century. His ideas, um, have been spread, um, disseminated, and um, 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 taught in Saudi Arabia. But then, as a result of the marriage of Saudi Arabia and oil money, there has been, over the last 50 to 60 years, a spread of this particular interpretation of Islam across the Islamic world. Um, the Saudi education system, the scholarships that have been provided to students from different parts of the Islamic world that come to Saudi Arabia, to become, uh, quote unquote, religiously educated and to go back in their communities has, I think, spread this particular form of Islam and has become so mainstream within Sunni Islam that a lot of Sunni Muslims simply think that the Wahhabi interpretation is authentic Islam. Um, the idea that you know you can't listen to music, that women have to be sort of deeply segregated and marginalized, um, you can't wish your Christian friends Merry Christmas, um, all of these sort of issues that didn't have any particular sort of um, grounding in Muslim societies until relatively recently. You know, if you look at Muslim societies in the 40s and 50s, they were much more tolerant, much more open than they are today. And a big part of that has to do with the spreading and the mainstreaming and the negative effects of Saudi education. Just to give you an example, I was in uh, Malaysia in late September, and I was actually shocked when I went to Malaysia, how mainstream Saudi Wahhabi views had dominated the periphery of the Islamic world. And so the big debate when I arrive in Malaysia is how there is this debate in Malaysian society as to whether minority groups, uh, Christians and Hindus primarily, can use the word Allah, which means God in Arabic, in their own religious scriptures and texts. And these Sunni Muslim groups were saying, no, that is a word that can only and exclusively be used. And this is a big debate. And this comes out of a particular Wahhabi interpretation of Islam. But of course, you can't, I think, understand the negative and corrosive effects of Saudi Arabia and Wahhabi Islam unless you also honestly look at the very close and symbiotic relationship that Saudi Arabia has had with the West since 1945, when President Roosevelt met with then King Ibn Saud on an aircraft carrier and struck in a certain alliance with Saudi Arabia. Um, Saudi Arabia is often referred to as one of those moderate Arab states, but I don't see any moderation within Saudi society. And we um, were really exposed to this. This is not, not something new. Everyone sort of instinctively knows this. In, on September 11th in the United States, it was uh, reported that 15 out of the 19 hijackers came from one country. That's not uh, Saudi Arabia. That's not, I think, an accident. It's not a fluke. It suggests something deeply problematic something deeply wrong with internal Saudi politics that uh, a lot of young men, and we're not talking about the poorest of the poor, we're talking about middle class educated men feel that their uh, best way to um, uh, spend their lives, or in this case end their lives, is to engage in this type of suicide operation. Um, it's been reported that Saudi nationals have carried out 60% of the ISIS attacks in Iraq since um, the, uh, since uh, September and October of this year. 60% of the ISIS attacks are um, coming from Saudi nationals, many of them coming across the border for reasons that I think are deeply connected to 9-11 and the fact that 19, 15 out of the 19 hijackers um, came from Saudi Arabia. So this is a big part. If you look at the actual textbooks that are used in the ISIS schools, the interpretation of Islam, the citing of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, it comes straight out of the Saudi 
Wahhabi narrative. That's the dominant ideological interpretation. So in summary, um, I think it's due to um, this particular puritanical, idealized, and thoroughly mythologized view of the past that Wahhabi Islam cannot, I think, reconcile its theological interpretation with the complexity and the diversity of cultures that constitute our modern world. And as a result, Wahhabi influence has added a dimension of oppressiveness and vehemence to contemporary Muslim life that frequently borders on the morbid, and you can see it in the theological justifications and the behavior of the Islamic State. This also, I think, partially explains why some young Muslims in the West um, um, have left their homes thinking that the Islamic State somehow embodies this model of Islamic authenticity, because it's very much the mainstreaming of Sunni Islam in North American communities and in Western communities that um, contributes to this type of radicalization. There's a lot more to the question of youth radicalization, but this is a big part of it. So in summary, um, um, just by way of a conclusion here, I think we're now facing in the Arab Islamic world a series of events that in many ways were predictable and were actually forecast many years ago, 14 years ago, in a series of Arab human development reports written by a leading team of Arab social scientists. They actually forecasted and predicted that the region was heading toward a deep crisis um, and a coming explosion. In 2002, in the first of these UN Arab Human Development Reports, these reports concluded that the Arab world is at a crossroads and that the region is hampered by three key deficits that are considered to be defining features of the Arab world. Number one, a freedom deficit. Number two, a women's empowerment deficit. And number three, a knowledge deficit. Compared with the rest of the world, the Arab countries had the lowest freedom scores in the 1990s, and when measured by indicators such as political processes, civil liberties, political rights, and free media, the Arab region had the lowest value of all the regions of the world when measured by voice and accountability. Similarly, in terms of the status of women, the Arab Human Development Report of 2002 revealed that by applying the UN gender empowerment measure to the Arab world, it revealed that this region was suffering from a glaring deficit of women's empowerment. Among the regions of the world, the Arab world ranks next to last as measured by the gender empowerment measure. Only Sub-Saharan Africa had a lower score. The 2004 UN Arab Development Report on the theme of freedom and good governance focused on questions of civil and political rights, popular participation, representative institutions, political accountability of leadership, the existence of the rule of law, equality of treatment, and independent judiciary, et cetera. All of these were in short supply. And so I'm reminded of, I think, the words of one of my favorite commentators on the Arab world, Rami Khoury, who in commenting on the rise of ISIS um, had the following words to say. He said that in, 19, in, he said that in, in the 45 years, of his writing about the Arab world, observing and commenting on it in terms of the conditions on the ground, the only thing that surprised him was why such an extremist phenomenon such as ISIS had not happened earlier. At least since around the 1970s, the average Arab citizen has lived in political, economic, and social systems that have offered zero accountability, political rights, and participation. States have been characterized by steadily expanding dysfunction and corruption Economic disparities um, um, have driven majorities into chronic poverty and humili humiliating inaction. And he goes on to note that these um, uh, trends are a direct result of the existing authoritarian political order in the Arab world. Um, this political order has virtually banned the development of one's full human potential in terms of intellect, creativity, public participation, culture, identity. The Islamic State phenomenon is the latest and perhaps not the final stop on a journey of mass Arab humiliation and dehumanization that has been primarily managed by autocratic Arab regimes that revolve around single families or clans with immense and continuing support from foreign patrons Foreign military attacks on Arab countries in Iraq and Libya, I think, have in some cases exacerbated this trend, as has Israel's aggression against the Palestinian people. But the single biggest driver of this kind of criminal Islamic extremism that we see today in the form of ISIS is predicated on the fact that several hundred millions of individual Arab men and women find that generation after generation that their own societies, in their own societies, they are unable to achieve their full humanity or potential. 
or exercise their full powers of thought and creativity. And in many cases, they are prevented from obtaining the basic necessities of life for themselves and their families. There was only one anecdote to the, uh, antidote to, the, um, to this long run process uh, that can, um, I think, fundamentally eliminate the Islamic State and all that represents. That is to stop pursuing the abusive and criminal policies that have demeaned millions of Arab men and women and shaped Arab societies for the last half century. Bombing Iraq and Syria, I think, will gain some needed time and probably must happen in combination with a series of military actions by local governments and Kurdish forces. However, if the ways of the corrupt Arab modern security state are not radically reversed, the mass desperation and hysteria that the Islamic State represents, I think, will only reemerge again in uh, more extreme forms in, um, uh, in the years to come. Um, and so I think that, in a nutshell, I think provides the broad uh, political and historic context that explains the rise of the, um, the, um, the Islamic State. I wanted to comment on the whole question of Obama and his um, strategy, whether it'll work or would, won't work, and what the uh, best plan forward is. But I want to leave some time for questions and answers. And I think I've gone over the, the, uh, the 30 minutes that I was allotted. So I'll stop there. I thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you.